Hey everyone, this is the fourth lecture in our clinical psychology unit. And this one, we are done really talking about what the disorders are, and now we're looking at how do we treat disorders. Um, none of them are really curable, but we can treat them, manage them, and make it so that they're not so disruptive to a person's life anymore. Um, let's get into it. All right, therapies fall under three types. We have psychotherapy, which are emotionally charged confining interactions between a trained therapist and a patient. Emotionally charged meaning you're um, encouraged to be vulnerable and open and talk about your feelings and face them. Um, it is a confidential um, relationship. So just like a medical doctor, for the most part, unless you are going to hurt yourself or others, everything you say with your therapist does remain confidential. We also use biomedical therapy, which is a fancy way of just saying medications. Um, but looking at things from a biological standpoint, we use medications or procedures to cure or treat the disorder. Um, and I'll get into details on both of those so you know examples. But then most of the time, most people suffering from some sort of um, mental health crisis or issue would have an eclectic approach to their treatment or their therapy, where doctors coordinate to use various techniques depending on what the person's going through. So let's say you are suffering from a major depressive episode, you're most likely going to use antidepressants, but you're also probably going to um, use some psychotherapy strategies as well. We're going to dive deeper into psychotherapies and biomedical therapies, um, but separately so you can see um, patterns and trends and groupings and things like that. The first type of psychotherapy we're going to look at is based off of the psychodynamic approach to psychology. And as we've learned extensively, um, that approach believes that most of our behavior is a result of our unconscious conflicts, desires, things like that, things that are happening within our mind that we don't even realize they're not on the surface. <clears throat> and so this therapy aims to bring things to the surface and again, under my little face box, um, or not again for the first time, it says unravel the unconscious mind and its conflicts, which I have in your notes already. And that should feel familiar to you. Um, another term that should feel familiar is free association that we talked about in the personality unit. This is where a therapist would encourage someone to just speak their mind. Just let, let the thoughts flow, see where they go. Even if you go on a tangent here and a tangent there, um, the therapist might ask you some open-ended questions to steer you in certain directions, but they want to see when you just talk openly and without reservation, what do you bring to the surface? But the therapist is looking for something specific. They are looking for a patient's edits. And what I mean by edits are, where does someone pause? Where does someone say, oh, wait, that's not what I meant. Where does someone stutter? Um, where does someone confuse their words because from the psychodynamic approach, the therapist believes that those are actually the important points. Wherever you pause, hesitate, stutter, change your story, that is getting at the root of those unconscious conflicts. And that is when the emotions matter most. And the therapist being trained in this approach would interpret those as, oh, maybe you're trying to protect this person in your life. And maybe there's more to unpack there. Or, oh, there's an issue you're having in your self-esteem. Let's see if we can bring that to the surface and dig deeper. So they're looking for those pauses, those edits to your, your expression, your free association. Um, and they're seeing those as like the key to getting to the bottom of the issue. I'm recording this at school. Sorry for the bell. I mean, you can tell I'm at school, duh. Um, the next approach is the humanistic approach. And as we know, it's all about um, acceptance, um, genuineness, and empathy. And so what the humanistic therapists will do, and they are all about helping people reach their, their ideal self and true self, and making them match, becoming their best self. And so those therapists will work on helping you boost your self-fulfillment by helping you with self-awareness and self-acceptance. So understanding who you truly are and um, developing self-esteem around who you are. Basically own who you are and make it the best version of yourself. Like don't live in denial, don't make excuses for your behavior, that sort of thing. But they would do it in a very loving and genuine way. They are also going to encourage patients to take responsibility for their own feelings and actions. Like yes, you might need love and support and empathy, but also what can you do to um, make your situation better or challenge these thoughts in your head. 
And so they're not focused on a cure. In fact, they very often encourage patients to help develop their own plan. So um, <clears throat> they're most known for um, an approach called client-centered therapy. Side note, they also, humanists have also evolved the concept of a patient to a client. So you don't feel sick. So you have more ownership. Like I am choosing to come to therapy. I am choosing to make, to confront my thoughts and make myself a better person. So I am a client using a service as opposed to a patient who needs fixing. And then the therapist listens in that accepting, genuine, and empathetic way that we know humanists do. And they encourage a person to face their problems productively and build their self-esteem, kind of like I said in the previous slide. And they, their, their main strategy, it's pretty basic. They use active listening. So if you think back to our Cookie Monster as a life coach video, if you saw that one with me, um, the therapist will listen, restate what I think you're saying is, and what do you mean by, and then acknowledge someone's feelings as valid, normal, acceptable, or logical, but then followed up with, so what can we do about it? And they'll try to get the client to come up with their own solutions to their own problems. Then we have cognitive therapy, which we know is about thinking. When we think cognition, we should think about thinking. So this is the belief that thoughts, feelings, and behaviors all influence each other. It's kind of that reciprocal determinism feeling in here too. That really what the therapy is in cognitive therapy is trying to do is help someone control their thoughts and control their self-talk in a really positive way. <clears throat> so there's two types of therapy within this category. Um, first, cognitive behavioral therapy, where they are focusing, the therapists are focusing on altering the way people act and the way they think. Okay, so cognitive behavioral therapy. Challenge those ways of thinking and say, hey, don't think in such a catastrophic way. Don't think in terms of worst case scenario. Don't think of um, excuses and what you can't do. Let's think about what you can do and then change your behavior accordingly. And I've got another graphic to help you with this. I just want to get to this other um, type of therapy first. Um, rational emotive behavior therapy, REBT, extremely popular type of therapy, but also very controversial. I'd like you to add a note to your notes here that this is the tough love sort of therapy. And so um, let me go through what's on the screen first and then I'll explain that tough love idea. So the belief by therapists who subscribe to this way of thinking is that most problems come from irrational thought. That thought that, um, there's our bell. That thought that, you know, if you if you don't get into the college of your choice, your life is over and you're never going to achieve your goals. That's catastrophic thinking. That's worst case scenario, scenario stuff. But that if you've got that in your head, that can really permeate into other areas of your life. And so a lot of problems might develop from that irrational thinking. Like that is just, you're, that is going too far, not getting into one school at one time period in your life is not going to destroy your goals. You might just have to approach it from a different way. So trying to show the patient their distorted thinking so that they can eliminate it. So that's what makes this controversial and makes it tough love. The therapist is basically saying like, what you're thinking does not make sense. It is not logical. You are wrong to think that. And that can be kind of harsh, but sometimes if someone is, is really kind of too far into this negative spiral of thinking, they need to hear that. They need to say someone like, they need someone to kind of not say toughen up, but to say, pause and think that through. Does that really make sense? Do you really think there's no other way to reach your goals other than getting into that one college in this one attempt that you've made? So here are some ways that, uh, here are some examples of like illogical thinking. So if you lose your job, someone who has illogical thinking might go all the way to, I'm worthless, it's hopeless, there's, there's, uh, my life will never be good again, what's the point? And that is someone who is stuck in like kind of this negative internal spiral, and that is a symptom of depression, of the cognitions of depression. However, someone who is more, who is not in a distor disordered depressive state who loses their job might think something like, my boss is a jerk, I deserve something better. Now these are still defense mechanisms, but they're not to that huge catastrophic thinking. It is something along the lines of like, 
this sucks, this is bad, but there might be something I can do about it. So that's someone who is not facing depression. So in cognitive therapy, they're going to try to challenge this person like, you like just because you lost your job, you know you still have worth. You know that there's still hope. There's still things you can do. So it's still done in a supportive manner, but it's pretty in your face. Okay, the final approach to psychology that also is rooted in therapy um, <clears throat> methods is behaviorism. Behavior therapy overall applies stress relief methods, rewards, and punishments to eliminate it, to eliminate unwanted behavior. So it's going to use learning principles, rewards punishments, reinforcements, that sort of thing to be like, hey, keep doing this or hey, stop doing that. And let's get into the examples right away because it will, I think it'll make a lot of, I think it'll make good sense. Um, you can't really use behavior techniques for things like depression. You can't really reward or punish someone for having good thoughts or bad thoughts or self-defeating thoughts or hopeful thoughts, but you can use it for overcoming things like, like phobias or um, altering behaviors. So exposure therapy is one way that you can help people overcome um, phobias. And the first strategy, these two strategies are very similar, but take opposite approaches. The first type of exposure therapy is when both of them, you're exposing someone to their phobias. So in flooding, you expose their patients to their fears repeatedly to lessen their anxiety. So like you kind of go all in. So if someone's afraid of flight, of flying you're going to kind of force them to go on a, on a plane ride and deal with it head on. Now, a therapist will either have already given them coping techniques or maybe, maybe even will go with them and kind of check in on their thinking and say, hey, you're doing great. Look at this. Nothing's wrong. Nothing to be afraid of. Look at all these people on this plane. Everyone is safe. It's okay. And basically forcing them to confront that fear and realize that, hey, your, your fears are exaggerated. Your fears are not based on anything um, in reality. The opposite, though similar, approach is systematic desensitization. This is kind of a more gentle exposure therapy where you expose patients to their fears in baby steps and you pair it with relaxation techniques. So let's say you have, you're afraid of snakes. We got this picture of a snake on the screen. If you're afraid of snakes, you might first be asked to look through a series of pictures of snakes and you might get anxious. Then the therapist will coach you on your deep breathing, your stress relief, your coping strategies, that sort of thing. Once that's kind of been done a couple times, then next time, maybe you have to watch a snake documentary. Same thing. Go through your breathing techniques, your stress relief techniques. How are you going to deal with that? Next time, maybe they actually have a snake in a cage or in an aquarium in the doctor's office. Go through your relaxation techniques until finally the snake is there. Maybe you're even asked to put it in your hands. Um, but again, it's baby steps towards confronting your fears and each time learning relaxation and coping techniques and realizing that your level of fear of that thing is out of proportion with the actual fear that you should have or that it's a justified level. And then the other type of um, <clears throat> method to behavior therapy is behavior modification. This is when a desired behavior is rewarded and undesired behaviors are punished. Ignore the token economy thing for a second. I want to give you an example to squish in here. Imagine that you've got a kid who bites their nails all the time um, and it's gross and it's unsanitary and maybe they're even biting their nails so far that like they're bleeding and you want to get them to stop doing it. You might paint some of that really nasty flavored nail polish on their fingers. So when they bite their nails, they say, ew, gross. And then they don't bite their nails anymore. They are being punished by matching, associating, combining um, this experience with biting their nails. So that should make them not want to do it anymore. We do this a lot with children. And we do this a lot with habits that children have that we're either trying to develop or get rid of. So that we often use token economies um, to reward or punish, but mostly to reward good behaviors. So the definition here, um, a patient exchanges a token um, earned for exhibiting the desired behavior for privileges and treats. So um, maybe in maybe in like at a house when a child does so many chores, they get stickers and then the stickers on a chart means uh, an extra dessert at dinner. Um, another example might be even in a prison where the prisoners um, can earn, well, 
Maybe they can get parole earlier for good behavior, but they can earn like TV privileges or outdoor privileges for behaving in ways that uh, the prison wants the inmates to behave in. Um, if you're in a psych ward and maybe you're dealing with someone who is refuses to get out of bed or refuses to do what the doctors want, they might get two stamps and those two stamps might give them extra TV time in the free time room or whatever. Um, so again, pairing rewards and punishments with either trying to increase or decrease certain behavior. Two more real quick types of psychotherapies I want to touch on. The first one is group therapy. And this is um, done often be in order to make a client benefit from knowing that others have similar problems as them. Um, if you sit in a big circle and everyone's talking about their struggles with alcoholism, their struggles with... Um, with trauma, their struggles with grief, the main takeaway is, hey, you're not alone. You're not crazy. You're not abnormal for thinking and feeling the way you do. Look, other people have it too. And then maybe other people can say, I'm struggling with this, but this is what's worked really well for me. And by everyone exchanging their thoughts and feelings, you don't feel so alone. And you also get some ideas, realistic ideas that you maybe even take more seriously because it's coming from someone who's experiencing the same thing, not from like a doctor or so-called expert who you might think might not understand. Um, this is also a good strategy because it can help more people at once and it often costs less for people who financially struggle to get, um, get therapy. And then family therapy is often used as well because it treats a family as a system that you are not a problem and you are not a problem and you are not the solution and you're not the good one, you're not the bad one, but how you as a family interact together is what contributes to the family problems or the family success. And that if your issues, so to speak, are a result of your family dynamic, then it needs to be handled in a family way. It helps members of the family identify their roles and what they should or shouldn't expect from one another, helps them, helps train them to improve their communication with one another, and work together um, to discover ways of preventing or resolving conflict. And everyone's speaking the same language, everyone's learning the same coping strategies, so it's more likely to be effective if the problems are rooted in a family dynamic. And the last chunk of your notes are biomedical treatment of disorders, in other words, using medication to um, <clears throat> help minimize the uh, symptoms of disorders. So not drugs recreationally or that people just explore with to um, hide their feelings, numb themselves from experiencing emotional trauma, but actual drugs prescribed by a medical professional that are meant to alter the way you think and the way you act. So I am grouping antipsychotics, antimanics, antidepressant, and anti-anxiety medications um, because while they all work specifically on the brain in different ways, together they all generally do the same thing. And that is this first bullet here. These are drugs that help alter the brain's chemistry, either increasing or decreasing neurotransmitters related to that disorder. So each one of these things, while different, and there's many examples of antidepressants and many examples of anti-anxiety medications, while there are many of these, collectively, they are all just trying to fix the levels of neurotransmitters in someone's brain. Two quick examples. One you've probably heard of, the other maybe not. Antidepressants like SSRIs, remember when we learned about agonists and antagonists, um, antidepressants help increase serotonin levels in a patient with depression. We know someone who is clinically depressed um, has low serotonin levels. So while they still need that cognitive behavior therapy, or maybe they need psychoanalysis or some other type of therapy, we that will only treat them so far if the serotonin levels in their brain still aren't where they should be. So the medication can help fix that. Similarly, antipsychotic medication can block dopamine receptors to lower dopamine activity because we do know in some disorders like schizophrenia, one of the symptoms is an overactive um, dopamine receptors. So there's like too much activity in person experiencing manic episodes or someone experiencing an anti, I'm sorry, uh, a schizophrenic episode. So you, that's too much dopamine. So you can take a medication to slow it down or lower the receptive activity. Big reason why this is not as easy as, Hey, just take a drug and you'll be better is that almost all of these drugs have side effects that are difficult to deal with. They might make you lethargic. They might make you gain weight. They One thing might calm your anxiety and another one might raise your anxiety. One might 
um, give you dry mouth. One might just make you agitated. So these can be really difficult to take on a regular basis because of the side effects. And last but not least are two non-drug medical options, biomedical options. So things that medical doctors can do to alter your brain that don't involve taking a medication. The first one is ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. This is only used to treat severe depression. Um, it sounds really harsh, but what it is, is electrodes are placed on the scalp and then your brain is somewhat shocked. Uh, so it passes an electrical current through the brain via two electrodes placed on the scalp. What it seems to do quite successfully is to reset the hypothalamus, which helps, has an influence as to how many, like what hormones are released at what time and kind of get it back into gear. Now, this is seen as fairly successful for severe depression, but it is also seen as kind of a last-ditch effort because it's still not a good thing for your brain. So it's basically if you've tried all, all the other options and your depression is so, so severe that it is um, making your life just miserable, your doctors might recommend this option, but this would be a last resort sort of thing. And then finally, psychosurgery. Um, you might have heard of the term lobotomy. Lobotomy like means taking out your brain, not the whole brain, but maybe taking out a part of your brain or maybe doing a split brain procedure where you're cutting nerves or taking out just little lesions or something like that between the frontal lobe and the centers of your inner brain structures Oops, um, to cause a certain behavior to go away or to minimize it. So basically saying this part of your brain, if we damage it on purpose because it, it's not working right, then hopefully that behavior will go away. Kind of a Another extreme can happen sort of procedure, but in very rare occurrences. All right, that's it. That's your last lecture, and it's time for examine. Good timing.